1 John 1, 9, when we introduce people to salvation, it says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful. It's the first thing out of uh, John's mouth. He is faithful and just. That word just is a legal term. That he, since he has promised to forgive our sins, then by God's own law, he has to keep his own law. God has to keep his word. If God doesn't keep his word, he's not God. If God says, I'm going to do this, and he doesn't do it, he's not just. He's a crook. Okay? Well, we've all served the crook before. And you don't serve the crook. Okay? Um, but God is just legally. He must forgive our sins. But the faithful part is in there. He's even, even without the law making him do it, God is still full of mercy and is going to do it. He's going to forgive your sins. You don't have to tell him to some stupid priest who's pretending to be holy when he's not. Amen? So I thank God for our salvation. It's a good salvation. Genesis 25, turn there. Um, my sweet, dear mother-in-law, Sister Gloria, asked me a question right before church, right before the service this afternoon, and, at, and actually I'm headed in that direction with this. Um, this is, uh, it starts out being about Jacob and Esau. But in that, God is showing us, you know, I'm, I love typology. I love the pictures that God draws for us in the Bible. They are what helps me understand God's doctrine. Uh, because I know if, if I'm thinking something, if I read something in the Bible and I'm thinking some kind of way out there thought. Somebody asked me, what keeps you in line? I said, I'm anchored to the word. And I may stray a little bit, but clink, the chain always pulls me back. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say, if it's not in scripture, it's not there. Don't believe in it. Don't, it's not real. Don't. So if I'm thinking some way out there thought, and I want to know if it's true or not, you know, first of all, I'm going to look for scripture, the plain words of the scripture. But I'm also going to look for a type, a story in the Bible where God draws that scene out for you. And he says, this is how it is. And typology has helped me understand, in my opinion, things that I wondered about for years and couldn't come up with a good answer. And that's when some people start reading commentaries or finding some preacher to listen to, whether he's wrong or right, they just believe what he says. But go to the scriptures and look for the stories. And God will show you. He'll draw the picture of what he means by it. And that's what we have in Genesis 25. Uh, let's go to the Lord. Let's pray. Uh, pray for one another tonight. Look around you. Think about somebody in our church. Uh, our visitors that came this morning. They're our neighbors. Uh, pray for them. That uh, maybe God spoke to them this morning. You know, I, I'm, I don't know that I'm everybody's preacher. Some, some people like me, some people don't. Um, I, hope they, I hope they got something out of the service. I hope that I can be a good neighbor to them and, um, and practice what I preached this morning on being a faithful Christian. Not just in here, but where I live and the places I go. So let's go to, the prayer, go to the Lord in prayer tonight. Father, we come to you. We thank you for loving us, for having tender compassion on us. We, God, we don't, sometimes don't think of you as being a tender and a compassionate and a merciful judge. But that's you. That's your nature. That's who you are. 
We thank you, God, for being faithful and for being just. Our world is full of unjust politicians, unjust leaders. Father, we need a God that will always be just. He'll always be right. He'll always judge righteous judgment. And Father, we ask you, God, for that judgment, but we ask you for mercy as well. And Father, we pray, Lord, for our brothers and our sisters, our friends in the Lord. Maybe they're struggling and we don't know about it. Maybe there's something that's really tearing at them, God, and we don't understand it. I pray, Father, that you would bless them, that you'd give them healing. Give them your grace. It really is sufficient. Father, I pray that you'd bless my family. Lord, you know sometimes I want to run and think I can make the devil leave my family alone. And Father, it's not right that the devil goes after them and not me. I pray, Father, that you would bless my children, my wife, my grandchildren. And Father, if the devil's got anything to do that he wants to do, he can come to me. I'll take it from him. The Lord, make him leave my family alone. Bless my daughter. Bless my grandson. I pray, good Lord, that you would bring healing to both of them. Bless Graceland. Father, I thank you for her. I thank you for all of my grandchildren. Even the one that I don't have now. I pray, God, that you would just bless my family and watch over them, keep them safe. But, Father, teach them how to be faithful to you. Teach them how to fight. Teach them how to pray, how to believe you and trust you the way you've done me. Bless your word tonight. Open up our eyes and help us to see things the way they really are. Thank you, God, for this book. In Jesus' name, amen. Genesis 25. <clears throat> um, I have, uh, let's see, I'm in 24 in my Bible. Here's 25. I have verse 23 up on the screen, but let's go back to the previous verse. Verse 22, this is where uh, Rebecca, she has conceived. Uh, Isaac uh, prayed for her that God would open up her womb. And that's, think, think, guys, think about that. Husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. And here is Isaac praying for his wife that she can conceive and bring forth a child. That's a big thing with women. Men don't understand it, but we understand that, that, that's, that it's there. Um, and now that she is with child, she finds out that she has two of them. And this was before ultrasound. They didn't know. They couldn't see inside of there. Um, I made a prediction that actually came right. The first time Lisa was at the doctor's office and they were doing an ultrasound of Lindsay. And I'm looking at that and I'm just, I'm amazed that we can see inside the, the mother's womb. I'm just, that is so awesome. And I said then... This would have been 1988. I said, probably by the time she grows up and has children of her own, they'll be able to see their face. Have you seen an ultrasound lately? You can see their face now. That's amazing that I was right once. It's amazing. Um, but anyway... She, now, she can feel two different children in her. And so in verse 22, the children struggled together within her. And she said, if it be so, why am I thus? And she went to inquire of the Lord. 
Listen, listen to your Bible. Do what these people did. She went to ask the Lord, Lord, why is this, why is it this way? Why are these children fighting in me already? They're fighting one another. Why are they doing that? And God gave her an answer. And the Lord said unto her, two nations are in thy womb. The word nation is what we're going to focus on tonight. And two, and then God defines it further, two manner of people shall be separated from thy bowels. Notice how God is already separating them. He's, he's going to see one one way and one another way. God already, he already has loved and chosen Jacob and he has already hated and tossed aside uh, Esau. He's already turned away from him. And God is going to mark him to show that his judgment is just. And he's showing us an example of something. To me, all of this is prophecy. It's history, yes. It happened exactly the way the Bible says. But it is prophecy as well. What is it, what is it foretelling? What is it trying to, to show us? Two manner of people shall be separated from thy bowels. And the one people shall be stronger than the other. And the elder shall serve the younger. Now as of this point, she doesn't know who is who. She doesn't know that one of them already... What's the sign, Gloria, when a pregnant woman and she has, she has a lot of heartburn? What does that mean? My wife has told me just about everything her mother has ever come up with. And she would say, yep, this one's going to have a lot of hair. It's making me sick to my stomach. Well, it wasn't Lindsay. I can, get, I can tell you that. Lindsay was about bald, so anyway. Um, she doesn't know which one is which, but God has already marked one of them. He's already separated them, and we're going to see that when they're born, they, they don't look like each other. And so, in verse 24, I don't believe I have that, no. In verse 24, when her days to be delivered were fulfilled, behold, there were twins in her womb. And the first came out red, all over like a hairy garment and they called his name Esau later he's called Edom which is Adam Adam which means red like the clay of the earth it means basically the earth the Hebrew word for man is Adam and it basically means red like the dirt that's what everybody no matter what color skin they have, when you cut them open, what color are they? Red. Okay? Everything's red in us. And that, is a, that in itself is a type of what? What is red a symbol of in the Bible? Sin. Though your sins be as scarlet, they should be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they should be wool it wasn't an accident that the sea that israel walked through was the red sea because it represented paul said they were baptized what were they baptized in the blood the blood so they were walking through the red sea being cleansed by that and that was their baptism um, where else can I go with that? But anyway, that's the color of sin. It's a stain. Okay? And it's, and it's the color of sin. So, one of these men represents the man of sin. And he has hair all over his body. There's actually a, a disease 
called hypertrichosis. Um, P.T. Barnum had a guy that literally was, he was the dog boy, they called him. And it was because he had this disease where he grew hair like fur all over his body. Um, there was a, a family, I think from Mexico. I know they were Hispanic, but it was a, an entire family like this. I don't know if any of them are still alive, but a few years ago I saw the video of them. Just about everybody in that family had hair just all over them. So it, it actually is a, a medical condition that causes this. But God wanted you to see why he's rejecting Esau and he's choosing Jacob. He's, he colors Esau red and he covers him with hair. So he is a beast. He is the man of sin. Okay, that's what he represents. Jacob then is the opposite of him. He is the one that God is going to fulfill his covenant. Remember, Abraham had a son before Isaac. He had Ishmael. But Ishmael was a wild man. And he sent him out. And he accepted only Isaac. That's where his covenant was going to flow through. Now Isaac is giving birth to twins. And God is going to accept one of them and reject the other. It's sort of like in the law on on the Day of Atonement, they bring two goats. One of them, by lot, if I remember right, they cast lots, and one of them was selected by God to bear the sins of the people of Israel. And the high priest would then place his hands on the head of that goat called the scapegoat. That's where we get that term, the scapegoat. And the sins of Israel are discharged to the head of that goat. And that goat is separated out from God's people by being sent out into the wilderness. When Christ was crucified, what was on his head? The crown of thorns. And thorns are the curse that God gave to Adam concerning his sin. So here's Christ now bearing the sins of all mankind upon his head, just like the scapegoat did. And I, I love this. That verse, though your sins be as scarlet, they should be white as snow, they'd be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Then when John sees Jesus in Revelation 1, he sees him and he looks at him and he said that his hair was like was white like wool as snow. Now, because Christ has already atoned for our sins, the crown of thorns is gone. Amen. And now Christ's hair, though your sins be as scarlet, now his hair is white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. He literally was the Lamb of God. Amen. I love this stuff. I'm having fun. You can go home if you want. Except Jaden. Now, all through the Bible, you see, you see these two nations. Two manner of people. Gloria was asking me about these UFOs. She said, I call them flying saucers. That was the term used back in her day. Then they changed it to UFOs, unidentified flying objects. The military uses the term UAP, unknown aerial phenomenon, because they're not always saucer shaped. They're not always like a disc. So it's an unknown aerial phenomenon, something up there that we don't know what it is. And from a military standpoint, you never ever want to have some something there that could be an enemy that you don't know who they are, what they want, and how they do things. You, you want to know as much about them, know your enemy, as much about them as you can. And if you think the military has ignored this, 
since Roswell, New Mexico, 1947, you're dead wrong. During World War II, the American pilots thought that that was something that the Germans had come up with. The German pilots thought it was something that the Yankees had come up with. The Americans. Because they were seeing these things out there and they didn't know what they were. But they were following all of our planes. I'll get to that in a little bit. Philippians 2.15. Here's one nation. Well, actually both of them are listed here. Number one, that you may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God. So nation number one is all of those whose sins have been washed away and covered by the blood of the Lamb. So that God now sees us as blameless and harmless and he considers us his sons. I, I wrestled for a while. The two places in the Bible where it gives the qualifications for a bishop, a pastor. In both places it says the bishop must be blameless. And I'm going, I'm not qualified. I'm not qualified. And God spoke to my heart one day and said, Mike, who is? How many preachers do you know? And you know some good preachers. Yeah, I do know some good preachers, some good men. Mike, they're sinners. Okay. It's saying that if he's going to be the leader of saved people, he must be saved. His sins must be washed away as well which says that I am the same kind of sinner as you are. I am no different than anybody else here. I had to get on my knees before God the same way you did. No difference whatsoever. Though, so the nation number one is blameless and harmless. They are the sons of God. They are without rebuke. There is nothing now that can be laid to their charge. There is no accusation that will stick with them. But we are in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation. The word crooked. It's the serpent. It's the way of the serpent. It's the winding. Serpents can never make a straight line. God designed them to always be crooked. And that's how they are. They, we are now the sons of God and we are now blameless and we are without rebuke even though the accuser of the brethren Satan stands and tells God oh geez, God you see that see what he did but God's sin you see what he's doing now he's praying he's praying he's asking me for forgiveness you know what I'm going to do devil just to make you mad I'm going to forgive him of everything he's done so we are in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation among whom ye shine as lights in the world. I have people that ask me every now and then, how is God letting all this stuff happen? Why is God letting all of these terrible things happen in this world? Why is God allowing that? Shouldn't God come and intervene? Hey, we're the stars now. Literally. We are angels. We are messengers. We don't have the body yet, but we're getting it. And the stars only shine brightest when it's dark outside. There's stars up above right now, but you can't see them. Even if it wasn't cloudy, you wouldn't be able to see them. Because the light of the sun outshines them all. But when that sun is gone, you can see every one of those stars. And that's what's happening now. I absolutely believe that darkness is approaching and it's getting darker and darker and darker every day. But what is happening simultaneously is that the true saints of God are shining brighter and brighter as those days goes on. Two nations, okay? First Peter 2, 9. You are a chosen... There's four things here which points to the gospel. You are a, number one, a chosen generation. This number four also points to the spirit realm. Okay? 
a chosen generation. The word generation has the word gene in it. It's DNA. This is our DNA. This book, the, the word, the seed. We are a royal priesthood. Meaning that instead of us coming from the lineage of Levi, which was the priesthood under the Moses law, now there is a new priesthood that did not come from Levi. It came from Judah, who is the fourth son of Jacob. Okay? That number four sticks out. Here we have a new high priest. He's, he's the high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Melchizedek was either an angel who was a, uh, a head of a contingent of priestly angels. And you see them like in the book of Revelation. In Revelation 8, one angel. Uh, there are angels in attendance there in the temple of God. One of them takes uh, coal, a coal from the altar and casts it down to the earth. Or I, I can't remember it right. But anyway, you see the, the, an angelic priesthood in heaven. Well, we are now part of that. We have been chosen by God. We're a chosen generation, real royal priesthood. Number three, a holy nation. And again... That holiness was never by our own doing. It was always, always, always supposed to be by the blood of Jesus Christ. That's what makes us holy. Nothing else but the blood. And then number four, a peculiar people. That means that we are different. And we're supposed to be different. The way we think, the way we see the world, the way we believe the Bible, the way we carry out our daily lives. We're not supposed to be like everybody else. We are supposed to be different. And God is the one who makes the difference in us. I've seen people try to change themselves. I'm one of them. And it doesn't work. I mean, I want to be different. But God makes you a certain way. And if God wants the change to happen, he changes you. And when he does, he does it right. I remember a, a man got saved in this church years when I was a boy. His name was Bill. And um, Bill had, you know, a 70s haircut. He had long hair down, down to his, just down to his shoulders here. You know who I'm talking about? Bill Chandler. And um, nobody said a word to him. He got saved. Gave his life to the Lord. Three weeks later, snip, 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 snip. Went and got his hair cut. Nobody told him to do that. The preacher didn't say, uh, you're saved now. You should probably get that cut off. Nobody told him that. He, he might not have even read it in the scripture. It's just something in him said, you know what? Get, I'm going to cut my hair. Okay. Uh, an old friend that, you, that grew up in this church with me, Mike Henderson. Sterling, you and I went out to talk to him that night. And I just knew God had told me to go see him. I'll never forget that. And he had a big old ponytail coming out the back. And... I talked his ear off that night trying to get, but he, he wouldn't budge. I prayed, I prayed, I prayed, nothing, nothing, nothing. He got saved between that Thursday and that Sunday morning. Or he rededicated his life back to the Lord. And he came down the altar that Sunday and we prayed. And he had said something to me later that day. He said, I'm still going to keep my hair, my ponytail. He said, that's kind of a thing with me. But you know what? I didn't say a word. He showed up one day, snip, thing was gone. Never said a word to him. When God makes you different, you're different. God is the one who does that. That, that. that you should show forth the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So we, we are this nation. We are, we are um, Jacob. 
Jacob, um, well, I'm, I'm getting away from myself, but anyway, we are Jacob in this, in this analogy here. Psalm 33, 12. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. Now, if you were to go to uh, Iran, which I wouldn't go, but if you were to go to Iran, do they have a God? Yeah, it's Allah. And is there freedom of religion in Iran? I don't know. I don't think so. Maybe there's not a law against it, but you might think twice before hanging a cross in front of a building somewhere over there. Or Syria or any of these other militaristic Islamic states that exist over there. You get your head cut off for being a Christian. Or North Korea. Does North Korea have a God? His name is Kim Jong-un. And those people are educated from babies up that their leader is their God to them. Uh, Kim Jong-il, the grandfather, uh, Kim Dum Dum, his son, I don't know, remember what his name was. But anyway, he was a God to those people. But blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord and the people whom he, he hath chosen. Match that up with what we just read. We are a chosen generation. This goes with that. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord and the people whom he hath chosen for his own inheritance. Meaning that we are sons of God. We're going to inherit what Christ inherits. Remember I was teaching in Sunday school this morning about Jesus getting the book. That book was all things. And we inherit with Christ all things. We have been made joint heirs, the Bible says, with Jesus. Mm. Psalm 43, 1. Judge me, O God, and plead my cause against an ungodly nation. Here's, here's Esau. Esau is the man of sin. He's a beast. He represents the ungodly nation. Oh, deliver me from the deceitful and unjust man. So two nations here. One nation in this verse calls to God and say, God, judge me and plead my cause against the wickedness of this world. Listen, the world is not going to be fair to you. Jot that down, especially you young people. Remember this, the world is not a fair place. It does not play fair with everybody. There are always going to be people who get away with everything they do. And you might say, well, if they can get away with it, I can get away with it. Don't fall for that. Because if God loves you like he loves me, he'll beat you nearly to death over your sins. If you start thinking, you can get away with whatever you want. But that nation calls and pleads to God against the other nation, an ungodly nation. They are deceitful and they are unjust. And we, we just talked about the word just. God is faithful and just. These people are not just. We have judges who sit in every county in this country. Some of them are good. Some of them are crooked. We would like to think that ju fair judgment is given out in our courts of law. and that We would like to think that we're a nation that abides by the law. Well, we don't. And we have judges that rule unjustly. And you're never, in some cases, going to get justice the way you want it. But you can appeal to a higher court. Appeal to God and God will judge for you. Amen. Uh, Proverbs 14, 34. Righteousness exalteth a nation. So this is Jacob. Jacob is exalted because he's righteous. God has endowed him with righteousness. Here's the other nation. But sin is a reproach to any people. Um... Who was telling me? It was Brian this morning telling me. 
and I want to send this guy a, some money, but that would be wrong. A priest in San Francisco, Nancy Pelosi's Catholic Church, St. Nancy, mother of harlots, <laughs> refuses to give her communion now. And I'm going, Woo! listen, I, yeah, I still hate Catholicism. I think it's, it's still mystery Babylon, but I appreciate the man standing up to her. And I'd like to send him a check for a hundred bucks or something like that. Tell him to go get drunk. <laughs> Pray for his soul. Amen. Righteousness exalted the nation. There used to be a time. Listen. The time when we didn't have problems out of the Muslim states was a time when America knew what was right and wrong. Now, these Muslim states hate us. Russia hates us. Why does Vladimir Putin hate America? Because we allow sodomite marriage. We allow the sodomites to do whatever they want and pervert this nation. And Vladimir Putin is an antichrist as far as I'm concerned, but he's right on that. The reproach against this country is our sins. Isaiah 1, 4, ah, sinful nation. This, is, this would be Esau, a people laden with iniquity, a seed. There's that word, DNA. They are a seed of evildoers. Meaning it's in their genes. It's in their genetics. They do it. That's how they're made. Children that are corruptors. They have forsaken the Lord. They've provoked the Holy One of Israel unto anger. And they are gone away backward. See, you and I, Paul said it like this. Um, how did he say it? I press toward the, the mark for the prize of the high calling in Christ Jesus. He said he's going toward the, the finish line. Israel or this nation of evildoers has turned around and started running the other way. You'll never win that race running the opposite direction. But they've gone backwards. Instead of going forward to the New Testament, they have gone back to Mount Sinai and they insist that the Ten Commandments is their law, and that's what's going to get them into heaven. Isaiah 26, 2, Open ye the gates, that the righteous nation which keepeth the truth may enter in. Who's the only nation that's going to be allowed into heaven? It is the righteous nation. It is the peculiar people, the chosen generation, the holy nation, the Bible says. They're the ones which keep the truth. Amen? We keep the truth. We are the ones that may enter in. Somebody who has this idea that God does this balance thing with your good deeds and your bad deeds, they don't know the Bible. God is not going to open the gates for anybody who has a sin laid to their charge. One sin to their charge, and you're not going in. Christ must remove all of that and equal the balance. And God gives that to those who hold on to the truth. Isaiah 26, 15. Thou hast increased the nation, O Lord. Thou hast increased the nation. Thou art glorified. Thou hast removed it far unto all the ends of the earth. I like this. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. During the thousand year reign, the earth is going to be ours. And, and notice this. Thou hast increased the nation and removed it far unto all the ends of the earth. There's no room for any sinners in the thousand year reign of Christ. It's all righteous people. God's people. Oh, won't that be so good? Hearken unto me, my people, and give ear unto me, O my nation, for a law shall proceed from me, and I will make my judgment to rest for a light of the people. 
He, this is Jacob. They are, God calls them his people. They are his nation. And a law shall proceed from them. And that law was not from Moses. It's from Jesus. And it's the law of love. It's the law that says, love the Lord your God with all your heart and love your neighbor as yourself. Uh, Isaiah 55, 5, Behold, thou shalt call a nation that thou knowest not, and nations that knew not thee shall run unto thee because of the Lord thy God and for the Holy One of Israel, for he hath glorified thee. That's the calling of the Gentiles to be part of the Israel of God. Is the way the New Testament puts it. We are the Israel of God, along with those Jews that God chooses. Isaiah 58, 2, yet they seek me daily and delight to know my ways as a nation that did righteousness and forsook not the ordinance of their God. They ask of me the ordinances of justice. They take delight in approaching to God. Look at this. The holy nation, the peculiar people are people who love to pray. Look at that. They take delight in approaching to God. Prayer is not some, drud, uh, some menial task that they must perform five times a day in order to please Allah or anything like that. Or I have to say, excuse me, I have to say my 25 Hail Marys to pardon my sins that I did last week. That's nonsense. Prayer is not a punishment, but that's what the Catholic Church has turned it into. I've got to recite these prayers 50 times if I'm going to have my sins forgiven. They're like prayers of punishment. It's not. It's a delight to those who are part of God's people. Isaiah 65, 1. I am sought of them that ask not for me. I am found of them that sought me not. I said, behold me, behold me unto a nation that was not called by my name. And here again, he's talking about the Gentiles who were not the, who, of Abraham, Isaac, or Jacob. And yet now we are the Israel of God. Isaiah 66, 8. Who hath heard such a thing? Or who hath seen such things? Shall the earth be made to bring forth in one day? He's asking the question, if you put a seed in the ground, are you going to get a stool and sit there and watch it come up? It'll be up by the end of the day and it'll be flowering and having apples on it. No. Or shall a nation be born at once? For as soon as Zion travailed, she brought forth her children. Look at that. God said, I'm not only going to save them, but as soon as they travail, I'm going to bring them forth. I'm going to do it quickly. God's good at that. Now, Gloria, this is for you. The, one of these pictures, Matthew, can you move that, flying, that saucer there, that flying saucer up there? They can't see the middle picture. One of these pictures is a devil. The others are aliens. In fact, that's the wrong, that's the wrong one. Yeah, that one. Or just stand there. There we go. Jeremiah 5.15. There you go. That'll work. That's good. Gloria asked the question, has anybody ever captured one of these flying saucers? And I very quickly went through that verse in Psalm 82, 6 and 7, where I'd heard the story of Roswell, how a UFO crashed and there were dead aliens there. And I, I, I thought it maybe could be true, but it bothered me because I said, I've been saying all along, these are devils. These are evil angels and they're of that realm. They don't die. They're gods. That's what makes them different from us is that they do not have mortality. They don't die. So how can these be spirits? If they crashed their ship and they died. So she asked me, has anybody ever captured one? I said, yeah, and I can actually show you from the Bible that it's possible that they actually did it. 
1947, there were actually three, three UFOs. Um, and they didn't find the third one until a couple of years later. But they could tell that all three of these had crashed into one another. And the prevailing theory is, is that why they crashed at Roswell is because Roswell was the only place in the world where atomic weapons were stored. Roswell, New Mexico. And the United States Army had a very powerful set of radar complexes there that nobody else in the world had because we were protecting those atomic weapons. We didn't want anybody to fly in, take them, we didn't want, it, nothing. And the theory is, and this has been told by several people that I've read, that it was the radar that messed their flight systems up. But a crashed ship, three dead aliens, one of them survived until about 1951. That's the story. Is it possible? According to the Bible now, I can say yes, it's true. I can say that. Um, I told that it's, it's amazing what Germans don't know. In that interview that I had with that German lady Friday morning, since they're doing research in UFOs, I said, well, I said, actually, in 1941, there was one that crashed down here at Cape Girardeau. And uh, a minister was called in the middle of the night to come out to this guy's farm, this field, and perform last rites on these, they said these people that died in a crash. So he goes out thinking an airplane crashed. He goes out there, doesn't see an airplane. He sees this saucer-shaped thing sticking in the ground. And he looks over and there's three bodies that are covered up. And the fire trucks were there, police were there. The next thing he knows, there's military guys there. And they pull the cover back. And he said, there's three little beings laying on the ground there. They look like children with great big fat heads. And he said, I didn't know what they were, but he performed last rites on them. And next thing he knows, he's got a, some army guy in his face saying, you were never here. You saw nothing. If you love your family, you'll keep your mouth shut. They didn't threaten him. They threatened his family. He did tell his wife he died. And on her deathbed, she told this story. To her children. This happened in 1941. That was six years before Roswell. And I told that to her. And then I said, there is also a story. You've probably heard of this. That a saucer crashed in Germany um, when Hitler was in power. And Hitler had it taken to a castle. And they were supposed to reverse engineer it. Werner von Braun said because he was asked when Werner von Braun was brought to America to work on our rockets, somebody asked him, how did you guys, how did you Germans get so much technology so quick? And he said, we had help. We were helped. And when I told this young lady that story of how Hitler's men had a crashed UFO and they were trying to reverse engineer it, she said, I've never heard that. We are not told much in Germany about Hitler. I think that's a mistake. I think it's a mistake. Yeah, I get it that they're ashamed that they ever turned into that. But to not ever have that happen again, you need to warn people. She didn't, she had no idea. She said, we're not told much about Hitler. Jeremiah 5.15, you look at this verse in your Bible, underline it. Lo, I will bring a nation upon you from far. A nation. All this time, this word nation is applied, especially to us, a spiritual nation. You see what I'm saying? It's a nation of spirits. We are of the same breed now as the angels. 
when we shed off this body, we will be immortal like the angels of heaven. And we will not be married nor given in marriage to other angels. Um, or to human beings, for that matter. But we have been talking, referring to the two nations as spiritual nations. And God said, Lo, I will bring a nation upon you from far. O house of Israel, saith the Lord, it is a mighty nation. It is an ancient nation. A nation whose language thou knowest not, neither understandest what they say. That is the, almost the same language that God used in Deuteronomy 28 when he told Israel, if you go against my covenant here, I'm going to bring a nation to you from, as, from, from the end of heaven as, that flies as faster than an eagle, a nation of fierce countenance. That means they look evil. And a, a nation whose tongue thou shalt not understand. There isn't a language left on this earth that nobody knows. Okay, we know all the languages now. But there is amongst the evil angels a language that they speak. The image far on your far left is actually not intended to be an alien. Aleister Crowley, who was a British occultist, a very evil man who had basically studied occultism all of his life. He was able to make contact with this spirit. And he conjured up this spirit and he was told the name of the spirit was called Lamb, L-A-M. And when asked what that name meant, it means the way. What did Jesus say he was? I am the way. So here's this evil, familiar spirit. And Crowley draws a picture of him. And lo and behold, he looks like every other gray, big-headed alien that everybody who has said they've been abducted has seen. Every one of them. This nation is the nation I believe that's coming. They are devils. They are gods. So then how could they die? God said, I have said you're gods but ye shall die like men and fall like one of the princes. God said they'll die like men when they fall from heaven, and they are going to die like men. God even said that about Lucifer in Isaiah 14. He said, is this the man that made the nations quake or whatever? But now he's in hell. Okay, he's going to go to hell just like everybody else does. Jeremiah 6, thus saith the Lord, behold, a people cometh from the north country. And a great nation shall be raised from the sides of the earth. Joel chapter 1. Um, let me read verse 6. For a nation has come up upon my land, strong and without number. How can it be without number? They're angels. Angels have an infinity number. But one third of them are evil. And they are a nation without number whose teeth are the teeth of a lion... And, that, and that's a description of the devils that come out of the pit in Revelation 9. He hath laid my vine waste. Jesus said, I am the vine, ye are the branches. And barked my fig tree. He hath made it clean bare and cast it away. The branches thereof are made white. In other words, this nation is meant to destroy the church. That's what it's coming for, is to destroy the church. God's church, the body of Christ, will it succeed? No, will not succeed. I'm on the winning side for once. Amen? Let's stand to our feet. I wasn't done, but let's stand to our feet. The, wheat, the story of the wheat and the tares. 
is a reference to these two nations. The wheat are the children of God who shine forth as the sun. Christ is the sun. We are going to look like Jesus in the resurrection. The tares or darnel, poison darnel, they look like wheat, they seem like wheat, but they have a fungus growing on them that makes you drunk first, then it kills you. That's the poison darnel. That's what the enemy sowed. And Christ made it very clear that the tares um, are the children of the wicked one. Um, and they are the ones who do wicked deeds in this world. They are, they are unrighteous people. That's who the tares are. Uh, and they literally are the children of the wicked one. They have... In Daniel chapter 2, that nation is going to mingle themselves with the seed of men. Mingle themselves into man's DNA. Whew. That's going to make a good documentary. We'll see how it turns out. Father, there's a lot of things in this book that I still don't understand. But I sure love finding stuff out. And I thank you, God, that you can still show us. Because we love your word. We thank you for it. This book has everything in it. Everything for us. Lord, help us to live it, to trust it, and to share it, Lord, with people that we know and love. People that we don't know. Help us, dear God, as we... Try to find and make disciples for your kingdom. Blessed be your name, but blessed is your word above your name. And we ask this in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen.